I'm Sarah Langan, and you should be watching The Crew Reviews. Gentlemen, let's welcome Sarah Langan to the show. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hey, Thank you. this welcome. is going to be a good one. Really Ooh. thrilled to have you in the crew reviews. <laughs> Thanks so, for having me. Oh, absolutely. Sarah, we, we read dozens and dozens and dozens of thrillers each year, um, both because we want to and also for the show. And it's rare that we get to say a book is like nothing we've ever read. Good Neighbors is like nothing I've ever read. Right. Um, so can you give our viewers a quick overview of the book? And then can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the idea? Okay, sure. Um, so, oh, I just went full screen. <laughs> oh my God. Ta -da. Um, <laughs> well, you are the star of the show today. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the story is about uh, newcomers to a Long Island town and it's a cul-de-sac and everyone else there knows each other. And the newcomers are kind of uh, what everyone else considers ghetto. And so they have a hard time adjusting to this town, but the reason they've moved there is they want a better life for their children. And they're sort of aggressively seeking a middle-class life and it's their dream, you know, the American dream. And they befriend the neighbors um, until there's a disagreement and there's a misunderstanding between the two main moms. And suddenly everybody on the cul-de-sac who is in the in crowd um, believes rumors about the newcomer family and tensions start to rise. And at the same time, the story is set a little bit in the future where climate change has more of a grip on the American consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have experienced this, but sinkholes are forming right. because of climate change. So uh, everyone knows that a sinkhole is going to come eventually to this block because they have a big park in the middle of it. and it seems as if it's going to come. And the story opens when tensions are at their highest and the neighbors are not fitting in and they're excluded from a 4th of July barbecue that everyone else is at and they can hear the party going on. And so they decide to join anyway and try and force their way into friendships with these people who aren't accepting them. And right at that moment, the sinkhole opens up and chaos ensues. And then as the story continues, the, the newcomers can keep trying to get along. And the, the queen bee mother, um, her daughter falls into the sinkhole. Mm -hmm. And she goes wild, the mother, and is so beside herself with grief that she begins to imagine that the other family has done something bad to her daughter. And it's their fault that all of this is happening and she begins to get the neighbors to believe this story and then it's what happens after that these these newcomers and a whole block who can't stand them so you uh i actually haven't really seen you i mean you, you talk about how you 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 set the story in the future it's not that far in the future but you use a cool uh story device that um I haven't really seen before in the thriller genre and it's you 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 give readers a glimpse of the future looking back through news articles and i was curious about when maybe you thought of that idea to include in the story like was that at the at the onset or when you were brainstorming the idea for the story or did it come about as you were writing it well i started the story i have my roots in horror that's a lot of what i've written and so i started the story as a horror novel and uh, what happened was a monster, instead of a sinkhole, it was like an asteroid hits and it's a monster, you know, and, and the monster comes out and like the people start misbehaving because evil's infected them. And like, I couldn't make that story work. And I didn't like that story. And I think it's because like, I no longer saw the world that way. And also because I think it's, I think it's 
not the narrative I want to be telling in the world that we're living in right now. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think that people are so divided and, but I also think that, and it's so easy to say, well, that other guy is evil. That guy's inhuman. And it's very easy right now to dehumanize people. And I just couldn't do it. I was like, this isn't, you know, after 2016, I was like, our country's crazy. Like our country is falling, tearing itself apart. I'm really going to write a story about how people are really evil inside monsters. I can't do it. So I, I changed the story and I was like, maybe I don't write horror right now. Maybe it's, it's just, what are the human elements that keep people? Yeah, you can come in. Um, At a point. School. (laughs) (laughs) I got two of them. Don't worry. Yeah, we got two here too. It's joyful. My other one's going to come in in a minute and be like, I have nothing to do. Um, (laughs) So, but anyway, so the newspaper articles, I was like, I want to write something though that you can't put down. And I was thinking, what's what's a book I've never like? You just you don't stop reading. And I think Carrie, Mm -hmm. if you guys have read Carrie, and. Carrie does have those articles from the oh, future. That's right. Oh, that's a great And so I kind of studied them. Like, how does this work? And how did he use this? And I think it's sort of, you know, I think of uh, Good Neighbors as a play. Like, Our Town is one of my favorite mm-hmm. plays. And I think Dogville is pretty amazing too, but horrifying, like hard to sit through. <laughs> yeah. And I, I kind of was thinking of them together and being a narrator. And so, so for me, those articles were my god's eye view on the story and Ooh. how i was trying to say like well this is what i'm actually saying right now and and yeah. you know this is- well i loved how you, you you tease just enough like it's a it's a news article you're like all right we'll get to the meat to it let me know let me know let me know and you tease just enough and you're like <laughs> damn it <laughs> should yeah. i flip ahead to the next couple of chapters to see the next news article or should i just continue all right on? <laughs> right we well, i you found myself mentioning you know kind of evil behavior you're kind of describing it pretty well there and i've said on social media a number of times already that reading your book that i recognized almost every single person uh described in that book as somebody who i knew growing up either a neighbor or somebody working with or this or that the other And, and i saw a lot of the familiar traits the person that's the wanting the 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 person that's kind of in control of everybody all these different characteristics and nuances that I recognize were these characters pulled from your own experience uh, over the years? You know, I think um, I had an idea of what I wanted the ending to be. And I was like, how do I make this happen and make it believable? And that's really hard to do, you know, and, and because I think that most people are good. So I had to come up and I hope I did it right, you know, well, whatever, but let's assume I did. Like what I had to come up with was um, the exact combination of personalities that would make this thing happen. You know, I don't think it would happen every day. I don't think people are inherently that easy to manipulate, but in this situation, and I think once you false accusation of child abuse true accusation you know as yeah it takes a life of its care, own people lose their minds yeah. you mm-hmm. know but for to answer your question i think a little bit i grew up on a cul-de-sac not a cul-de-sac i grew up on a street when i in the 80s and uh all of us used to play manhunt in the summertime yeah sure oh yeah yeah and but there were some kids who were just mean yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Group, like mean. Yeah. Like there wasn't I had a next door neighbor who would just throw gum in my hair. You know, he's like <laughs> five years older than me. And I was like, you know, <laughs> right. how can you look at yourself in the mirror? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like six. But you know, so there was but there's something really Lord of the Flies about a whole bunch of kids when they get together. Yeah, very sure. It's sort of have to form their own allegiances out of you know, survival needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, okay. I think the kids were yeah. something I grew up with. Yep. Well, as I, as I read, and this is kind of expanding on the same point, but as I read Good Neighbors, it was incredibly easy to picture the relationships and the tragedies unfolding as they did in the story. It, it really felt believable. 
Um, and as original as I, the story was, and it really was, there was this nagging familiarity that I could not place. And then I set it down for a second and I happened to open up Twitter. And in real time, <laughs> you can see these kind of eating our own conflicts and brazen hate mongering that plays out every day on, on social media. Um, did social media have any impact um, and the way people interact have any impact or influence on your story? Yeah, no, that was uh, a large part of the book is what yeah. that's, is, you know, I, I don't think that they're, I think they're reacting to social media or mm -hmm. a metaphor for that. Um, mm -hmm as much as they are to each other. And that sort of constantly doubling down on a position that they didn't even think about very much when they took it, but now they can't take it back. I think that's like the essence of social yeah. media. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, why is it? Like, it's a sunny face? day and someone's like, shut up, it's not sunny. And you're like, it's sunny, you know? <laughs> Global warming. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you could never uh, prove them wrong. Yeah. I mean, like you just, yeah, it's no one's no one sensitive person. I know, not, not not person is never the word. Yeah, you're not a not person. Well, um, there are varying uh, viewpoints in the storyline, and you make good use of it. You used uh, different points of views, like uh, Rhea's, Gertie's, Arlo's, and Shelley's. Um, how did you write those parts? Did you um, were they all at once? Was it linear, or or was it like their voices popped in your head? And you're like, okay, this is who I'm writing. Um, you know, I kind of had to con like backtrack and say I, I tend to write a little cartoonishly at first and I'm like it's you know it's a hot mom that everybody <laughs> hates and says dumb things it's like too smart mean mom you know <laughs> and then you go like, out and you and you and you make it you expand on it you pull like a PTA it out. meeting oh my gosh I thought I was the only one that wrote like that <laughs> <laughs> good and then good. you know and then your editor's like or your agent my agent would be like geez i'm not sure people really talk like that and you're like you're right um <laughs> you don't know the people i do <laughs> yeah but i did do a lot of research on um narcissism uh i didn't know what narcissism was but i was i knew at first i was researching kitty genovese you know that story of the woman she uh I don't know that one. <laughs> it, it's like the 1960s late 1960s she was in queens in like uh, an apartment complex coming home and her boyfriend I, I may have this i may be garbling the story a little bit uh started beating her attacking her and she was screaming and people in the building came out and said leave her alone get away from her let her go and it looked as if he did, everyone went back to what they were doing and then he dragged her around a building mm. and beat her to death. But mm. she was like, he then he ran away and she was still alive and kind of screaming. And uh, people in the building had been calling the police. And then one woman ran out and held her as she died, oh, right? right. But, and, but no one knows that, or no one told that story when it happened. The story they told and they taught in sociology classes at least when I was, you know, in the in the late '90s, was that uh, no one called the police, and that she died alone, and that this is how people act, and this is this is human nature, that people are like this, and we were all taught that weirdly, mm. but then it came out the woman who'd held her was like, but I held her as she died, and then people in the building were like, I swear I called the police. And I didn't see her body or I would have, you know, done something. She was dragged behind an alley. And it turned out that the cops, the NYPD, just didn't want people knowing they'd been called. So they just lied. Oh, and really? Yeah. So, so I, I was researching that. And, you know, I, at first I was going to tell the story of people being shitty and not helping somebody in an apartment building. And then I was like, oh, this isn't a true story. People aren't shitty. They don't do that. <laughs> Right. They take risks. They're, you know, and so I was like, well, how, how, what is the story I'm telling then? And so I kept doing more and more research in psychology and learned about narcissists. And I was like, that's my in because narcissists, they're so interesting mm. and complicated. And they are the only people who are both sane, but will murder when they're, um, they're 
their ideas of themselves are threatened and they, they just lose it. Yeah. So, you know, I thought that was really interesting. So they'll do anything of, to keep that glue together, uh, yeah. together to keep that personality of who they are. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll, you know, if they're, you know, accused of insider trading and it's all coming down and they don't want their wife to find out, they might kill their wife. <laughs> they might come home and just do Jeez. it. And not if, themselves. You know, just, they're terrified. They're like, yeah. she can't know, you know, yeah. then she'll know I'm a fraud. Right. I'll just kill her, which is <sighs> so yikes. Yeah, well, all- we talked about, or you, you, you kind of talked about, and Chris mentioned that, that there was multiple, multiple points of view. And when I was reading it, I kind of hooked on to Gertie in a, in a, in a strange sort of way. And she was kind of sweet and she was kind of hopeful, but then she was also really tragic and kind of the way that you would predict like a high school homecoming queen would be after 10 years of, uh, of a class reunion. Um, what do you think through all of that, her greatest strength was in the face of all this? Oh, I love Gertie so much. Yeah. Um, I just, I think she never stops trying. And I think that's the only thing that matters about yeah. anybody. You know, it's like her, her whole goal in life, I feel like, is to just do better and be better and like raise her kids better. And she's just like throwing as much as she can up against the wall. Yeah. And yeah. like, you know, she does this horrible thing in the beginning of the book that is she drives away you know when the kids are getting made fun of because she just panics you know she's no idea what to do and i think by the end of the book she's she wouldn't do that and because because i think it it just ate her she was like why did i do that why did i do that how do i not do that yeah she had a good uh, character yeah yeah Yeah. i just i i found i found like about 20 of my classmates from high school in that boat (laughs) (laughs) most of the prom (laughs) queens uh, well, okay. So let's say, let, let me ask you this: of the how many families were there? Were there eighteen households? Can I look at the map? There's a map. Yeah, there's a map. I'll okay. look at the map. Too. Okay. Well, so I, I so think a whole there, bunch left. You I, know? Think there were, I think there were eighteen households. Okay. So let me ask you this question then: which one of those households most closely resembles your own family? Oh no! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it's in there. It's in there. <laughs> All right. I'm going to find the map. <laughs> That's right at the beginning. Uh, I think it is page. Because there's 30 something characters. And I think. All right. It's, it's near the July 10th know. incident. Let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you just count the houses. 40, yeah. around 47. Page 47. I feel like. Is it like my childhood house? My house growing up? Let's just say now. Oh, now. Oh, we're totally like the Chuns or whoever left. <laughs> we have been like, <laughs> there's a sinkhole. We're leaving. <laughs> so sorry for the rest lift. of you. What about your family growing up? Different different family? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm going to, yeah, I'm not going to say. <laughs> Mom, dad, don't watch. <laughs> No one watches this show. No, they won't. No, no <laughs> they won't watch it. <laughs> no one's family watches this show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not even my mother. Actually, she does. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> mom, none of our families are in there. Our families would have left. No, nah, mine went perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, my family's always the one like in the horror movie that um that just has to stick around to see what the hell's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I think my growing up family would have stayed just they would have felt obliged you know because in the the story the girl falls down the sinkhole and I think a lot of the neighbors feel like they have to be there for the Mm. resolution of of her being raised up dead or alive yeah you know yep well you talked about horror your work has been compared favorably with the master of horror Stephen King um seen it seen it in print, seen your name, seen people, lots of people saying that your stuff is up there with his better work, actually. Not just his work, but his better work. You've also been praised by such horror and suspense luminaries as uh, Peter Straub, Tess Gerritsen, and a guy who wrote the scariest book I've ever read, um, Jack Ketchum. Um, A book that I still can't get rid of (laughs) out of my head. Um, Where and when did that instinct 
to tell horror stories begin? Or in other words, what's a nice person like you doing in a dark place like this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think like, I actually, I think there's a few different things like the, you know, growing up, I just loved reading horror. But I also think, you know, my brain works kind of differently. I always like, like people have told me my whole life I'm weird, you know? <laughs> and I always thought they were weird to think that, but maybe I am weird, you know, You're like. <laughs> weird is cool. Weird's oh, yeah. in, by the That's way. That's who we yeah. are. Weird is in. And you're a writer, so you have to be weird. Yeah, right? you can't right. be voices right. in your head. <laughs> like I live in my own little world and I see things in metaphors and and you know and I, I I for me like horror articulates and and I like anything that's a thriller too anything that's like a heightened reality yeah but I, th I think you can say so much when you have metaphors and then you're not hitting people over the head you know hmm. All right very Shakespearean well, uh, the behavior of the uh, characters in, in Good Neighbors, it's, uh, it's dark, it's filled with lies and rumors and group hysteria, and it's fiction. But as writers, we know there's always a uh, little truth in the fiction. Um, with that in mind, did writing this domestic thriller have you looking at yourself inwardly, or did it have you outwardly examining, examining your neighbors and your relationships uh, a little bit closer? I think I, I was inspecting myself more. Hmm. and it was harder and like i'm hearing people say like some of the reactions in on goodreads are, are you know this upset me this bothered me this made me think about myself mm -hmm. and i'm like you know you're not alone like <laughs> like i i had the same so writing ria and writing gertie um you know i i think we all have these holes in our personalities that we're unaware of like just, just from growing up and, and the ways that we learn to adapt to our childhoods, um, often our coping mechanisms, no matter how great our upbringings are. You know, there's, there's just, so, you know, I'm not great with conflict and I worry about taking care of women all the time. And, and I wasn't aware of it until I had kids. And then I was like ushering my kids through their lives and having to model conflict, you know, resolution and having to model stuff that I didn't know how to do. So like, I didn't do what Gertie did. I didn't drive away while my kids were getting teased, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's not that extreme, but I could see pieces of myself in that. And it was kind of shocking to me. And upsetting and I was like this is the meat like if this is this upsetting to me you know, this this is what drives a character Oof. well well I as far as looking outwardly I, I saw a lot of these two in a lot of the darker characters <laughs> in, in the book, all of them <laughs> well let me shift gears for a second so um you're a founding matter member or board member I believe of the uh, Shirley Jackson Awards. So tell us a little bit more about that and, and what compelled you to feel like you, you wanted to put yourself uh, into that role. Um, you know, I was approached by uh, the people who were putting it together right as it was happening. And I thought it would be just fun, honestly. I really didn't think more about it than that. And um, you know, it's worked out really well. Joanne Cox is the administrator and she put a ton of hard work into it. And Paul Tremblay, um, he sort of rotated off the board and now he's an advisor. But he did a ton of work. Um, and it's just, it's kind of taken off, which is terrific. Um, but what I like about it is first I get to um, read the good stuff when it comes up. I'm not a juror anymore, but I still get access to all the, uh -huh. the files if I want it. But also uh, it's been maybe 15 years and it's been a real lifeline for me to have that community that I can always just pop into. Cause I don't, you know, when, when you're raising kids and you're not publishing, it feels very untethered. Mm -hmm. So what, what's really made a difference to me is just these calls, these check-ins that I got from these guys over the years. Yeah. And then anytime I showed up at a convention, I had a group of people to hang out with already. Yeah. 
I didn't have to be like, you know. I'm I would like to have other right people now, besides but... these two to hang yeah. out with at conventions. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> you love hanging out with us. <laughs> Drinking with them, maybe. <laughs> so Sarah, what was it? What was it like the lasting image or feeling you got or you had when you finished this book? Um I I kind of think of the Grace Paley, you know, I ended on that, which is is mm. like this idea of I'm trying to say something without telling the end of the book. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the thing I, I think about is, is the hope we all have as humans is that we make the world a little bit better. Yeah. And the idea that the next generation has less debt than, than we inherited. Right. And I was thinking about that. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, no it's perfect sense. sense. Yeah. yeah. So th there are a lot of underlying themes in this book. Um, I mean, there, you could really, as a reader, I can find several different themes. Is there something specific? Or, or did you just, um, you know, describe it that you want readers to take away from the book? Um, I think shame is a terrible emotion. Mm -hmm. And I think whatever people like shame is always the source of conflict. It's always the source of misunderstanding, mm. not of conflict, of misunderstanding, of, of heightened emotions, of, of misbehavior within and without. And I think whatever, uh, don't be so, like, don't be ashamed of your thoughts. <laughs> you yeah, know, I, yeah. I feel like that's Rhea and Gertie and these characters are just constantly feeling, you know, I think there's that pressure of, of parenthood but there's also like arlo has these you know he wishes he'd been more successful and all this stuff that right. if he were able to just unwrap a little bit and talk about it wouldn't feel like such a burden right is there judgment in there too That's interesting I mean, being judged by others i mean is that do you think where a lot of that comes from you know i think we think we're going to be judged by others but it almost never happened right <laughs> judge yourself you know like me. whenever you're like i have to tell you something and you tell your friend they're like i did that you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, <laughs> you're late to the party yeah <laughs> or or that uh we never really grow up and we stay clicky teenagers for most yeah of everything's eighth grade everything stays in eighth grade hey a quick question for you you have your mfa right is that from columbia yeah Right. And we've talked to a number of authors, you know, a lot of bestsellers and they've gone through the MFA program. So, so I was always kind of curious, what did you find the most valuable lesson or most valuable part of that whole program as to how it changed you and bettered you in your career as an author? Um, I think for me, like I went straight out of college and I think, um, it's so hard to be a writer because people around you are like, yeah, that's a nice dream that you have. <laughs> <laughs> and going there, no one talked about it like that. It yeah. was like, this is the work, do the that's work. Cool. Right. And so having that, by the time I was done, I was like, I am a writer. This, you know, I don't know how it's going to pan out financially for me. Right. But when people around me would say, well, that's nice. I'd be like, I don't think we need to be in conversation. You know, like I, I had more, I, I felt, I felt like I was a writer. There was years, you know, way more years to just keep learning the craft. Right. Right. That's what it gave me. And it also, you know, I'm still friends with some of those people that I, I graduated with and it's just nice to have those peers too yeah because thanksgiving it's like didn't you start writing that like two months ago <laughs> aren't you done yet <laughs> or, or like my instance where they're like when's your book getting published <laughs> yeah my father-in-law uh said it again today asked me again oh, um, brutal. no but you know you think you think it's bad you you at least grew up in new york where people under some people at least might have understood an artistic artistic pursuit i grew up in kokomo indiana where i might as well have said I want to be the first man on Mars. <laughs> In fact, that probably would have gotten more encouragement yeah. Uh, yeah. to be that 
<laughs> so uh, let me, I'm going to ask you something we've never asked a guest. Uh-oh. What did we not ask you that you want to answer? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Name that too? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I like when I was thinking about um, the, oh, people have been asking me if this is specifically about Trump. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah. no, um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of parallels, but I think it's a, I'm talking about our entire culture. Yeah. As opposed to this, you know, yeah. Moment in time. Yeah, right. A really, a really good friend of mine um, made the comment that Trump revealed things that were already there. It's not like he just suddenly yeah, came and all of a sudden we had all these problems that we never had before. It was more like a pulling back of the ripping off of a scab, I suppose, more than a pulling back of the curtain. But um, well, it's you know, I live in Los Angeles and I live in a liberal part of it, and you use the word Trumper, and it means like dummy who mm. wants to give you COVID, right? Yeah, right. Like a and knuckle like, dragger. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, okay, but what if they're like a human being? <laughs> and <laughs> like <laughs> who who unfortunately was like behind the storming of the Capitol because they thought that the election had been stolen. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, yeah. I don't know. I mean I'm not it's I'm not it's not I have no interest in in arguing politics because right, it's right. too exhausting. No, I know exactly what you're saying. And I, yeah. I think, I, I actually think that, I hope that when people read this book, they they that's what they think about. That's what I hope they take from it. I hope they think about the fact that people's perceptions of themselves and of others are, are rooted in something. And it's not just, you know, it's not always ignorance. It's 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 a number of different factors. And I mean, that's what I took away as I read it. It, it could be just, shame. Yeah. You know, we need to guard against judging ourselves and judging others so but <clears throat> terrific terrific book but you have survived Ooh. the the yes. main portion of the interview um congratulations <laughs> now we're gonna ruin your career Here we, we raise a drink and <laughs> let's get silly i'm so, so sad that i'm not last night i had a had a bowl of rda maybe that Okay. Delicious. All right. So there you go. One up me there. <laughs> <laughs> Mike lives in Colorado too. Mm. Well, um, as we like to say, so we we all have uh, strong mothers, and our mothers always say, "Think before you speak." And mm. this is the portion where you ignore mom, um, and you just speak without thinking. And I will. We will each ask you three questions, mm -hmm. and I will go first. And as Mike always says, don't put a lot of thought in your answers because we didn't put a lot of thought into the questions. <laughs> but that's stream not, of consciousness. That's not really true. <laughs> so your husband, JT Petty, is also a creative who works in film, television, video games. And there's all there's usually a horror element, at least from what I from the research that I did, the deep research I did into yeah. JT. Mm -hmm. Um, who has the more twisted imagination? <laughs> He does. Ooh. Oh, that a boy. <laughs> Bring him on. <laughs> no, was it? No, he'll not be to... like, yes. <laughs> well, not to get too personal, but since you both have a little bit of it, did your daughters inherit that gene? Yeah. Ooh. Good deal. Like a, a lot. World needs <laughs> I, I just watched The Ring with my nine year old, and she was like, it's not that scary. Whatever. <laughs> what? I've seen well, that. That's, that's actually a good segue into my next question. <laughs> What was that's the most awesome. terrified you ever were reading a book or watching a movie? Oh, that's good. Uh, the Exorcist. Yes. Sixth grade. Yes. I mm. read it and watched it. And the nuns told us we could be p possessed. And the perversity of Satan was that oh, yeah. Satan didn't pick bad kids. Satan picked good kids oh, yes. to let the world know that Satan was perverse. <laughs> I almost had that same exact conversation. Did we go to the same Catholic school? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I was like, I heard it happen to a boy in Canada and it's based on a true story. And yeah. the teacher was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. They still have nightmares. And, and, and my final About question. Catholic school. <laughs> final question is, if you could have one supernatural power, what would it be? Um... I think flying. 
Me too. Oh, oh, there you go. Easy. It's not even. It's well, not I even just like that. I want to be happy, <laughs> but I feel yeah, like, but, but like slow flying. Like or? I want power or flying. <laughs> flying would make me happy. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're thriller writers. And so it's safe to say that we spend a lot of time wondering how to kill people, mm. fictional people, not real fictional people. Um, so out of the four books you've written, which death or murder has been the most satisfying to oh, write? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, Let's get dark. Satisfying. That's a tricky <laughs> one. <laughs> like, probably I, of satisfying death definitely the missing because it was like like zombie vampires that ate people nice so here's the was, zombies <laughs> yeah my anti-hero lois larkin who is the lead zombie vampire like i think she eats her fiance who dumped her <laughs> i think so i don't remember quite but i liked that that was fun <laughs> No, I'm, I'm just going to predict that you're going to see a rush. You're going to see a rush on the sales of that book by anybody who been dumped. That. I want to read the rest of it. No, did the whole thing is like she's just so pissed she got dumped. <laughs> so where did she start? She started his head, feet. Where did that start? Do you? Rem- oh, so she. Uh, oh, in what page or? No, no, I'm just saying, oh, like, just body he's, parts. He's wanting to know body what parts. body parts. I just want to know body parts. <laughs> oh. She's a zombie, remember. right? So I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. I wish I did. Gotta go for the bone marrow. Or, but it is it that or I think it's either that or it's like she infected him and he and his new girlfriend like eat each other. Oh, that's like, yeah. See, that's even something better. Something like that. Yeah. I'm sad I don't remember. You are dark. Answer. Yeah, that's you it. You are yeah. dark. That's awesome. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> so all right. So um Good Neighbors takes place on Maple Street. And uh I read pretty cool description uh that someone had someone else had, had said it, it was eerily similar feeling to the classic rod sterling twilight zone episode the monsters are due on on maple street but if you had to slap a new title on the cover of this book what would it be oh um it would be a play on our town or it would be the monsters are due on maple street it would be Ooh, something like that that's cool that's cool yeah, oh, I like yeah. that. it was like very that. much you know I yeah. was thinking of that episode of Star. Episode. Mm. Uh, all right. So I, you, go ahead. I thought his name was pronounced was Sterling. It's Sterling. It's Sterling. Sterling. Like how I've, I'm 46 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so did we? Was it David Morrell that talked about him? Or no? Um, no, no. I, you're thinking. No, David Morrell talked about Sterling Silifont. Sterling. Yeah, that's what I'm like. I'm like I know we we've, we've talked Hoshi. about the name before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was it was, it was not that one. All right. So you moved away from New York City, the metro area. Um, but if you had to return, which neighborhood would you live in, and why? Uh, so Crown Heights is where we lived. So I would go back to Crown Heights, mm. or um, I loved the Upper West Side. Mm. Loved it. There you go. All right. All right. Here's my three. Number one, with a degree in toxicology, does your husband appreciate the value of keeping you happy? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. But it's not a- <laughs> <laughs> and he's still alive to agree. So I imagine that's true. <laughs> All right. Number two, uh, you're from New York. So what's the one thing you miss the most? Um. Being able to walk everywhere and knowing everybody on my street, like wow, Crown Heights, okay. everyone was like, hello, you know, um, yeah. I miss that. And I miss food, all the food, yeah. like all the, all the not good for you food. Yeah, sure. All right. Last one. Drum roll. Bram Stoker rises from the grave and offers you a blurb on your mm-hmm. next book. What does it say on the cover? Um, it reads like I had spicy food dreams. <laughs> remember, he, remember he like came up with the idea for like Lair of the White Worm because he had yes. spicy food. Yes. <laughs> I came back for the spicy food. <laughs> yes. oh. He's like, this is too much technology for me to understand. <laughs> Love that. 
I That's thought awesome. the postal service was scary. That's but. awesome. <laughs> Well, Sarah, we want to thank you for coming on the show. We want everybody who watches the show to go out and get, and that's terrible lighting, Good Neighbors. Right there, Jeez. folks. Look at mine. Almost, it says Good Neighbors. There you go. It's terrific. Um, this is a very unique read um, and just thrilling. And it has a lot, like a, it's heavy with theme, but not in a way that feels like it's heavy with theme. It's one of those things that you put down and it lives in your head for several days after um, and yep. and I'm probably more than that but I'm only several days past it so I can always speak to that. <laughs> but uh we really appreciate you quick read you won't put it down book. thank you thank you so much cheers it was great having you on Sarah thanks boys I love love meeting new authors and reading new authors and Sarah Langan is a great new to me author um, this book, Good Neighbors, is like nothing I've read. It's It's got a very unique premise. It's got a very unique style, a plot device that we talked about in the, in the show. And I'm um, just thrilled to have had her on the show. Appreciate her coming on and um, braving three strangers she didn't know. And every week, those three strangers are not strangers to you. It's Michael Houts, Chris Albanese, myself, Sean Cameron, we're the crew reviews. See you next Monday. And hoist a drink, folks. There it goes. Here we go. I'm Sarah Langan, and you should be watching the crew review. <laughs> Let me do it again. Okay. You're not supposed to laugh. <laughs> Isn't that funny? We're very serious. We're very serious, serious people. people here. <laughs> or not. No. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> ready. I'm Sarah Langan, and you should be watching the crew. I'm going to do it one more time. <laughs> Did everybody get another drink? I'm Sarah Langan, and you should be watching the crew. Re crew. Oh my God. <laughs> crew reviews. <laughs> Is this like rural jerk? <laughs> Remember that conversation we had at the beginning of the show where I was getting the last name screwed up? <laughs> we've, we've, you should we've be done, watching the rural... Okay. We've done multiple takes several times. Here we go. And three, two, one. All right. This is the outro for Sarah Langman. And good neighbors. Sean looks intense. He's been practicing all day. Here we go. Yeah. Three, two, button. Button that button. Look down. Yeah.